Hello there. Uh, I am actor and content creator Frazois, and I am joined by award-winning modder, ex-lawyer, uh, modern storyteller, and by all accounts, lovely bloke, Nick Pierce. Nick, thank you very yeah. much for making the time for this, mate. How are you? Uh, pretty well, thanks. How are you? Yeah, yeah, not bad. Not bad at all. Thank you. Um, and we're going to be talking about your game, The Forgotten City, mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty damn exciting. Uh, as of this recording, what have we got? Two days until yes, two days until it comes out. I mean, uh, by the time editing and everything happens, it'll probably yeah. be uh, <laughs> yeah. one day, or maybe it'll be on the day of release. But we'll see what happens. Uh, right. So to paraphrase the store page, the Forgotten City is a mystery adventure game of exploration and deduction. Combat is an option, but violence will only get you so far, and the player will be traveling two thousand years into the past to relive the final days of a cursed Roman city. I mean, it sounds absolutely amazing, mate. And I've looked at a lot of the uh, the, the teasers that you've put out. And um, yeah, colour me intrigued. Uh, are you excited? Yeah, I am. I think it's, um, I mean, it's been a, a four and a half year uh, development cycle. So I'm, I'm yeah, very, very excited to, to get it out there and get it in people's hands. And and uh, frankly, to go and take some time off once it's all done. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. So before we talk about the game, I'd love to learn a little bit more about the team because you've got a very small team that you've handpicked yourself. Um, I was wondering if you could introduce them and, and give us a rundown on, on how they made the cut. Sure. So there are three uh, main team members and uh, the, there's me, obviously. There's also Alex Goss, uh, who's our programmer. Um, before he joined our team, he was um, he just finished working on a VR spacewalk sim in consultation with NASA called Earthlight VR. That's um, and I just met him incredible. By, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's it is it's pretty cool. Um, and so I met him at a party by chance, and um, we got talking and just kind of clicked. And um, and within a few weeks, he'd, uh, he'd, he'd, um, he'd come over and started working with me. So yeah, that, that was pretty cool. Um, Did you get to and, explore the the VR uh, that he'd created? I did, yeah, yeah. It's pretty impressive. Um, and uh, and then the the second member of the team, or well, the other third member of the team, is uh, John Eyre, who's um, who's a, an Australian three D artist, um, who's uh, who's worked at uh, Defiant, which is a studio that made Hand of Fate and Hand of Fate Two. Um, really exceptional artist. The first time I saw his art station profile, I just went, "Wow, this is the guy." And uh, and I was fortunate enough that we're able to to get him on board, and, and he's been with us for uh, quite a few years as well. So. Yeah, we, yeah. we are a very small team, but we like to think that we're punching above our weight. <laughs> nice, nice. I mean, some of the shots that I've seen look absolutely gorgeous. So I always had this sort of um, you know, this sort of creative itch to make games, but there just weren't really any opportunities to to sort of explore and pursue that properly professionally in Australia in yeah. 1999 when I when I was trying to choose what I wanted to study at uni. So I ended up just uh, you know blowing that off and um and becoming a lawyer for a while but like i said the sort of the, that creative it's just sort of stuck with me for a while and and then you know so i had the opportunity to mod and, and that went well and so you know finally i had the opportunity to um to just to go and do what i really wanted to do which is make video games that's amazing um no, mm. i like geekdom is pretty cool nowadays uh it's, mm. it's certainly a lot cooler than it was uh when i i was growing up um yeah. <laughs> Did you ever have to deal with any of that, like stigma? Because you're saying you were you were distributing your games to your mates and things. Mm. Oh, look, all of my friends are pretty nerdy as well. Don't worry about that. Um, so that was <laughs> fine. Uh, actually, the the funny thing, I think probably the, the the most stigma I had to deal with was when I was in the legal profession. Um, I'd been making my mod just. It was a sort of don't ask, don't tell kind of thing. I, you know, that, there was no reason for me to tell them about it. Right. It was just costing in my spare time. But yeah, um, once it started getting international media coverage, um, uh, one of the senior colleagues sort of called me over to his computer, points at his screen where there's this, I think it was like a PC gamer or something article on the screen. And he goes, is this, this you? And, uh, and I was like, yes. And yeah, our, our, my relationship with my colleagues changed after that. It was, it was, yeah, it was a bit different. Interesting. Um, because I think, in the, I think in the legal profession, some people take the view that, um, that every waking hour of your life should be spent focused on your legal career. And I know that because someone literally said that to me. Oh, wow. Um, okay. And so, yeah, so, so ultimately I sort of, I felt that I had this choice between continuing with my legal career and doing something that I was really passionate about and, and possibly quite good at according to, you know, the, the reviews of the mod. So, so yeah, I just, you know, that was one of the reasons that I ended up taking the leap and I'm when, very glad that I did. 
when did you uh, when did your focus change uh, the first time around from from obviously you, you quite enjoyed the 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 creative aspect of games uh, when did you first focus on like training as a lawyer and 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 why did you pick that specifically um look i was in year 12 i'd won the literature and debating prizes so for me it just seemed like a no brainer i like words and i like arguing with people so i just uh so being a lawyer seemed like a like a, a natural sort of you know, continuation of that. Um, and look, I'm glad I did it. It was it was a great experience and I've learned an, an enormous amount. And and um, I think having a, just a solid set of general professional skills will help you in, in any career path. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, with that said, I was uh, I was definitely getting a bit bored of it by the time I was um, ready to jump into game dev. Yeah. And, and I mean, here you are uh, some years later, like with just a couple of days left to go until the release of your, your fully fledged game. How, how are you feeling? Um, look, a little bit nervous, but also mostly pretty zen. I mean, I think I've got what I wanted out of it. You know, I, I had a wonderful time making it. And um, there are lots of really wonderful parts of the game that, that still make me really happy every time I see them. Um, and yeah. Uh, yeah, I think um, I think. However, it, it sort of pans out. I'll, I'll be I'll be happy with what I've done. You know, I'm sort of looking forward to finding out what the future holds. That's a good way of looking at it. And so, speaking of uh, the setting, um, why Rome? Another good question. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, so look, I've, I've been a, an ancient Rome nerd for a while. Um, I have a, a, a stack of um, reference books, and I've travelled around Italy and um, and watched a lot of documentaries and that sort of thing. Um, uh, with that said, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert, which is why I eventually brought in um, the big guns. Uh, specifically, um, I've got a couple of historical consultants working with me, um, uh, Dr. Philip Matijak, who. Uh, has a DPhil from Oxford and teaches at Cambridge and has written 17 books. Um, and uh, Dr. Sophie Hay, who spent 20 years excavating the ruins of Pompeii. Um, both, you know, extremely knowledgeable and really lovely people, uh, by the way. Um, but anyway, um, so I, um, I, I, I wanted to set it in ancient Rome because um, a, a couple of reasons. First of all, the game is about um, collective punishment, right? So the, the, the core plot is um, there is a city uh, which has a curse and under that curse if one person sins everyone dies that's a form of collective punishment and collective punishment was well known to the romans you know they had decimation this this really shocking um, military practice where um if if uh, if there was a, a mutiny brewing within a cohort um then the cohort would be broken into groups of 10 and one in 10 men would be executed for the crimes of the collective regardless of whether or not they'd done anything wrong um, and uh, another example is um is in roman mythology um the, the roman poet ovid uh, told the story of Baucis and Philemon, um, who, uh, where basically a city was wiped out because it failed a bizarre moral morality test set by the gods. So, so this story about a city where if one person sins, everyone dies, is fits naturally with with uh, sort of ancient Rome. Um, I think it's also just really interesting to explore an ancient Roman city, and I personally have sort of fantasised about travelling back in time, and I think a lot of other people have too, and so. Uh, being able to sort of create this this uh, this city with with all this historically authentic art and architecture mm. has been um, has been a lot of fun, but it's also really really interesting to explore. And there's lots of little historical details in there for for sort of fellow history nerds. Um, and then finally, there are some other reasons too, which I can't really talk about without spoiling major plot points. So I think I'll just uh, okay, we'll, we'll yeah. zip that one. Um, so the, the the OG mod, obviously, you've got to work with the assets that you're given, um, mm. which is not a constraint that you've got when you can you can build your own world. Um, what was the what was the most important thing in terms of assets that you wanted to add to the game? Oh um, well, look, we we added every asset because essentially we had to rebuild the project from the ground up in Unreal with with 100% new assets. So we've we've sort of a, you know it's a new city, a new setting, new game world. Um, all the characters are new, all the voice acting is new, all the orchestral score is new. The script has been entirely rewritten. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say probably um, the 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 script, which is now twice as long as the original one, is probably the my sort of favorite upgrade i just always the, the the script for the mod always felt like a um a first draft to me and i would never had the chance to sort of you know, get the help of an editor or anything so um you know have, being able to take my time to sort of rewrite the script um and and fix the problems and, and add a whole bunch of new tw twists and quests and endings is was was yeah for me definitely my most you know the well the the, the part i found the most satisfying yeah 
Well, I mean, we'll touch on story a little bit more in a second, but um, just having a look through some of the the uh, the teasers that you've put out on like Twitter and things, um, the the detail that goes into all of the items that you can pick up and and interact mm -hmm. with in the game. Uh, yeah. is, do you have a fav favorite item that has been added? Um, I would say item. I think the the graffiti is a lot of fun. So I don't know if you're aware of this, but in in, in ancient Rome there was quite a lot of graffiti, and, and we know because you know it's, it's, a lot of it has survived, and uh, it's quite fascinating to to read it, and um and and sort of see how hilariously smutty and obscene it is. Um, and I think, I think it's I, sort of sorry. I, yeah. I think I saw a, 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 a one of them that was around. Uh, a fella had an orgy in a in a bathhouse and yeah. it <laughs> failed to satisfy any of the uh, the the other participants. Yeah, yeah. Should we say? So, I think it surprises people to learn that ancient Romans could be really quite earthy and funny because uh, I think the way they're depicted in a lot of historical fiction is is very sort of serious and you know you know you, you think of Caesar and you think of all these senators in their togas. What you don't think about is is sort of people you know com common class people who are you know who are writing obscene things and drawing penises on on walls and that sort of thing. But it's an important part of of the you know piecing together what ancient Roman culture was like and so. I worked with uh, Dr. Matty Zach to come up with um, with uh, some some um, you know Latin graffiti that's sort of sprinkled around the world that adds lots of flavour and it's kind of fun to explore and it's also attached to an achievement. So if you uh, if you want to get all the achievements, you're going to have to read the graffiti. I'm a big fan of achievements, so that speaks to me quite a bit. <laughs> Did you uh, come up with anything else interesting in in all of the the research that you've done? Probably, look, first of all, I'll say that um, Dr. Matisak and I um, exchanged well over 300 emails over the space of 20 months about all sorts of aspects of ancient Roman sort of history and archaeology. And and, uh, and and I learned an enormous amount, but I'd say by far the things that that get the, the most guffaws are um, the, uh, the, the public toilet, um, where uh, it's really, really very bizarre. Um, ancient Roman public toilets didn't have partitions, uh, meaning that you could make eye contact with people sort of over the aisle from you if you so chose. And I'm told uh, by Dr. Medizek that um, that people, it was actually, it could be quite a social occasion to, to go to the toilet. You could sit down and have a chat with your friends. Um, and then after that, um, you might clean yourself with a, uh, a sponge on a stick um, because they didn't have toilet paper. And so uh, there was this communal sponge on a stick that just kind of sat in the middle. And uh, so, oh, wow. yeah, really, really terror horrifying uh, in terms of uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah it's uh, so so we've we've faithfully recreated this um this public toilet just because we we thought it was amusing and and, and fascinating um and so there's lots of little things like that that people can go around and explore yeah. i mean not just the the public toilets but like the art and the architecture it's it's you, you've put so much effort into the uh making it accurate uh, how important mm. was that to you when you 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 were setting out yeah, well, we, we were really committed to, to getting everything right to the extent possible. So, you know, for example, we'd, um, we'd model a, a, the, the front of the temple and, uh, and then, you know, we would get advice saying, no, look, you're, you know, your columns are too close together or too far apart or, and, and the, you know, even the striations running up and down the columns, you know, that, that, that's not quite right. So we'd, we were absolutely um, trying to get tiny little details like that right. Um, and uh, I think at one point uh, in, in the script, I had a whole bunch of characters referring to this particular temple as a temple. And then uh, 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 Dr. Matty Snake pointed out, well, actually, that would technically be a shrine because it doesn't meet the definition of temple. So I had to go back and edit all of those lines to make people refer to it as, as shrine. Wow. Um, so, yeah, we were, we were pretty committed. Um, and I don't, I'm not aware of any, um, any sort of residual errors. Everything that was identified that we could fix, we have fixed. But with that said, it's... Um, you know, no doubt there will be people out there who, who can find um, issues with it, and, and if they can, and if they've got evidence to back up their the point, then we're absolutely um, open to, to them sort of pointing it out to us, and, and we'll do our best to fix it in a future patch update. Yeah, yeah, it looks like you've done uh, an amazing amount of groundwork, uh, so uh, I can't imagine there being too much, but you know, I suppose time will tell. Uh, but obviously, alongside all of the historical accuracy, there is a fair amount of fantasy in the uh, in the game itself. Yeah. Um, I, there's an... sorry, it's like mythology in the sense that so the, the the fictional elements are rooted in ancient Roman mythology. So there's nothing in there that, that I've just sort of or this there's not very much in there that I've just sort of made up. For example, um, you would have seen people being turned into gold in the um in in the trailers, and uh, so that's that's sort of a, a 
follows on from, um, you know, in, in, from mythology about the goddess uh, Diana. So the ancient Roman goddess Diana, who the Greeks called Artemis, uh, had a had a, um, a mythical golden bow. Um, and so yeah, in, in the game, the player is able to, to undertake a heist to steal that bow from her shrine and uh, and is then able to, you know, to use it. I mean, so I think, yeah, it's, it's the fictional aspect is certainly rooted in mythology, but we've had a bit of fun playing around with it. Yeah, yeah. I've seen some of the uh, the, the puzzles that uh, you've shown around the, the bow. It looks really, mm -hmm. really good. Uh, speaking of which, how how do you start with making a, a, a puzzle? Uh, do, you, do you start with the bow? Do you start with like it, what you want the player to uh, get out of it? Because you obviously they want it to be interesting and, and rewarding once it's um, mm -hmm. uh, once it's done. But where, where's the start point? It's a good question. So one of the starting points for us was that um, because this is a, an, an indie game and not a AAA action RPG with a massive budget, and massive team. Um, originally, I thought about having a whole bunch of weapons in the game, but it just we, we weren't going to be able to do it justice with the, the kind of production budget that we had. So I thought, well, instead of trying to do a whole wide variety of combat badly, what we should do is focus on something that's unique. Um, and something that we, you know, that, that hasn't been done before. And so, um, so we, we ran with this idea of the, the mythical golden bow, which turns anything organic into gold. So, for, uh, and then, and then we sort of thought about, okay, how can we, how can we have some fun with this? And so, for example, one of the ways is that, you know, if you, you can sort of shoot an enemy with it and turn them into a golden statue. Um, and then as another enemy sort of is, is coming towards you, if you can position yourself right, you can sort of boot the golden statue into the, the oncoming enemy and topple them over like Skittles. And that's really fun and satisfying. Um, or if, for example, if you come to a, uh, like a, a river that you can't cross uh, or a pond that's covered in algae, um, you could you know, shoot the, the algae, turn it into gold and then just walk across it like Jesus walking on water. Um, and, uh, and then of course, you know, I think one of the other examples that we've shared is um, you know, in a particular shrine, there's a there's a big hornet's nest, uh, you know, affixed to the ceiling. So if you shoot that, turn into gold uh, under its own weight, it falls and uh, and you know smashes a hole in the in the shrine floor, which then allows you to escape. So yeah, there's lots of sort of fun, interesting ways that we've um, we've managed to use this this um this golden bow device. And I think uh, I'm more, I'm hoping that people will have fun exploring and access using it to access little secret locations that they couldn't have accessed otherwise. Yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of uh, gameplay devices, uh, there's a there's a time loop mechanic uh, in mm -hmm. the game. Uh, could you just touch on that for two seconds? Sure. So it's um it's kind of a Groundhog Day style time loop, uh, but it's a little bit different in that um, if you die, you're dead. So you're not you, you can't just die and restart the day again. Um, but what happens is if you if you if you or anybody else breaks the golden rule, um, then all hell breaks loose and uh, it, it it triggers this. Um, apocalyptic event which begins wiping out everyone in the city um, but if you're fast and nimble enough then you'll be able to escape back to the time portal uh, from which you originated uh, and if you can run that gauntlet then you can leap into the time portal and then essentially rewind time to the beginning of the day um, having retained all the knowledge and items that you got from previous time loops so it's a little bit different so that's why I say it's different to other time loop games because you can you can carry, you can steal things from one timeline and bring them into another timeline, and that opens up really interesting things. For example, and, and this is I don't think I'm spoiling much by saying this, but um, the um, when you first arrive in the city, you'll find a woman who's um, who's dying and, and then dead uh, because of, of being poisoned and because she couldn't get life saving medicine in time. Uh, so what you can do is steal that life-saving medicine, triggering that apocalyptic event, and then race back to the portal, begin your day all over again, and this time race back down to the dying woman just in time to give her this medicine, and then she's then able to tell you what happened to her, which then sort of furthers your investigation. So there are all these little loops and, and ways that you can cleverly exploit the time loop to, to sort of advance the story and sort of ultimately solve the mystery. Um now, I just wanted to say, obviously, because it was previously a mod and, and there is a, a whole host of people out there that are going to uh, play this that may have already played it before. Uh, the store page says that you've take, taken the best elements of the mod. What were the, the bits that you really wanted to preserve? Um, so, look, the, the, fundamentally, the things that are preserved are the, the title and the premise. So, as with the mod, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, you, you discover the ruins of an, of an ancient underground city, travel back in time, try to figure out who or what is going to get everybody killed. Um, but 
everything else has been leveled up. So, um, so I've rewritten the script, um, which is now about twice as long and it has new and you know, twists um, and quests and story beats and, and endings. Um, uh, we've got new characters. Some of them are sort of uh, uh, reimaginings of, of characters who are in the mod, but there are a bunch of new characters. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we've got a, a beautiful new orchestral score by Michael Allen, the guy who made the, uh, the music for our mellow. Um, I've got uh, professional voice acting uh, from, a, from a wonderful uh, cast of actors, including uh, uh, Roger Ringrose, um, who's, uh, who's in the Witcher TV series. Um, and um, uh, there's a bunch of other stuff too. Um, oh, so the, yeah, there's new gameplay mechanics, uh, including the, the sort of mythical golden bow that allows you to turn, yeah. um, uh, you know, anything organic into gold. So yeah, there's a, the, I really wanted to make sure that anyone who's played the mod already would have, would find lots of new and fun content to explore in this. And I, I think we've achieved that. So yeah, I think if you like the mod, then you're really going to love the game. Excellent. Am I right in saying that there's, uh, there's, there's four separate classes for you to, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. And they each have a, a subtle advantage. Uh, there is um, the soldier, archaeologist, uh, amnesiac, and uh, fugitive. Um, and and so. from some of the pictures I've seen, one of them has a gun that they can take back with them. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's that's kind of a, a fun touch. So yeah, if you choose the soldier, your your subtle advantage is gun. Uh, which is <laughs> Very <say>. subtle. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You, you have a you have a pistol and ten bullets, but you can never get more. So you you really have to sort of use them judiciously. And I think that that actually kind of makes it more fun because you have to really like every bullet counts. Um, and uh, and just a word to the wise, you'll want to save at least one bullet for the for, for the endings. Um, right. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting insider information. Um, we're sort of almost out of time, but uh, one last thing that I really want to ask. Um, Easter eggs. Have <laughs> you put any Easter eggs in the game? Is there any that you can hint at now that people can be looking for? I think um, the the one that I really want to tell you about is also potentially a plot spoiler. Uh, it, it's sort of hard to explain, um, but basically, if you're a massive history nerd, uh, then uh, you will probably figure out some key plot points a little bit sooner than everybody else if you take your time and explore and uh, and just you know um, have have a look in, in every sort of nook and cranny. But I think that's probably all I can say at this point. Okay, okay, just keep eyes peeled then. Definitely. Well, Nick, I'm going to let you go now. Uh, thank you so flipping much for uh, for making time to to have a chat. And uh, yeah, I hope. By the end of this week, things will have settled down and you can start getting some more sleep. Um, yeah. <laughs> all the best with the release. I'm looking forward to getting my hands on it myself. Thanks, mate. Nice talking to you. Yeah, all the best.